Well, hello and welcome. This is Elliot Garber with our third episode of the Uncommon Veterinarian Podcast. Um, today, I'm really excited to have um, a very unique veterinarian, Dr. Mike Cranfield. Um, he works with the Mountain Gorilla Veterinary Project, and um, he's going to be talking to us about careers as a veterinarian in zoo and wildlife medicine and conservation working with a nonprofit organization, all that good stuff. So without further ado, um, Dr. Cranfield, why don't you just start off telling us a little bit about your current job and um, how you describe yourself when you first meet someone. That's usually difficult because I'll say I'm the director of the Mountain Gorilla Veterinary Project and they usually don't catch what I just said. Mm -hmm. And then I say, well, I'm part of the Gorilla Doctors and at least they have an idea of, of what species I'm talking about. And then they sort of say, well, what's that all about? And I say that our team, and we have 14 veterinarians, um, looks after the health issues of the eastern gorilla. And the eastern gorilla includes the eastern lowland gorillas and the mountain gorillas. And as veterinarians, obviously it would be difficult to deal with totally wild animals. And so the ones that we deal with are a subset of the wild ones which are habituated which allows us to, to monitor them and actually treat them and so they say well what's what's the health issues and in the east because these animals are in uh, well protected parks the the biggest issue to them is disease outbreaks and and so we're monitoring the Possible, for the possible transmission of diseases coming from people or even an outbreak of, of their own flora and fauna of, of diseases. Um, and then the, the other, well, so there, there's three things that go on there. That you must be sitting beside me in an airplane to hear this little version. <laughs> but anyway, um, there's three things that we do. And, and as I said, we monitor health. And we do that through the eyes of the trackers and guides. But twice a week, uh, at least, the veterinarians go up themselves and monitor that they go in and observe the uh, a group of gorillas for any you know uh, very subtle signs of of health problems and then if either the uh, trackers and guides or the veterinarians see a problem and it is life-threatening or man induced then we'll actually what we call intervene and intervene uh, intervening can be as simple as darting the animal with some antibiotics or or vitamins or uh, you know uh, antiparasitic drugs or whatever or it can be as in-depth as anesthetizing and doing surgery on the side of the, the mountain mm -hmm. and the third thing is uh, doing postmortems and that is uh, sort of it's it's a sad sort of deal but it's very revealing in that we we find out a lot of answers to the knowledge gaps that we have of what diseases are most important for the gorillas so those whole aspects are what we do um, with the gorillas themselves but we're trying to take a one health approach which means that the 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 health of the gorillas is dependent upon the the health of the other wildlife in that park and the health of the people that surround the park because these parks are surrounded by some of the densest populations in all of Africa and unfortunately they're only making about a dollar a day and therefore the education levels, the hygiene levels and the, and the medical services for them are, are pretty basic and so we're working with uh, human MDs obviously they're human and uh, they are doing some teaching in the hospitals and we're also running an employee health program which means that all the trackers, guides, supporters, researchers, veterinarians that are going to get close to the gorillas are put through um, a health program and monitored that way and then four times a year they and their families are uh, given uh, deworming medications and also an educational uh, lecture four times a year and, and so that really helps and now we're we're actually teaming up this trip is pretty exciting because there's a, a dairy practitioner on faculty at UC Davis that came over this time to assess the dairy uh, industry and we think that uh, we'll get some partnerships going with that so it's, it's really kind of exciting yeah that's what I've always loved um, hearing about your project is just the way that it has been able to integrate all those different things that I'm interested in as a veterinarian from public health to 
wildlife to economic development um, and clinical medicine all at the same time. I think it's rare that there are vets who actually get to keep their hands in all those um, pots over the course of their career. So it's cool to see that you've been successful at doing that. <laughs> well, we'd like to expand it, but yes, it's been successful with what we're doing so far. Cool. Um, well, maybe could you just tell us, um, give us a taste of the work that you've done with the project. Um, just uh, maybe describe one of your most exciting days or experiences that you've had working there with the gorillas. Well, I guess it's, it's an odd question because I, I looked at it at a question of what is exciting and then I thought, well, exciting is sort of, you can say, put it two ways, you could say rewarding, which is probably not uh, a good story, but what's as rewarding to me is, is watching the host country veterinarians grow and uh, rewarding or exciting to me is that each of the teams in the three countries now have done mobilizations of the gorillas on their own which is which I think is just wonderful if you actually look at, at excitement I think excitement happens when you know you're sort of out of your comfort zone and and that happens a fair amount uh, when you're in the midst of you know between 15 and 60 uh, free-ranging gorillas and I remember this one time I was in the Buindi Impenetrable Forest and there was a, a baby that wasn't doing very well that was nursing on the mother. And so we anesthetized the mother. And the baby was probably only about three weeks old, so it, uh, we didn't really have to anesthetize it to handle it. Well, we had inexperienced trackers and guides and we sort of had this powwow before we started. But they sort of got confused and dispersed when, when the silverbacks started displaying, but they, they gathered back up and they thought they had the silverback under control and they were moving out and, and basically what they do is just sort of beat sticks on the ground and, and sort of push the silverback back gently because we really don't, we want him around because in the end of the procedure the patient has to be back with the group. But anyway, so they think they have the silverback under control, but, but this infant is screaming because it's not anesthetized and again I don't want to anesthetize a three week old baby because I can handle it and do what I need to do so lo and behold it's screaming its head off and I turn around because I hear a noise and everybody is sort of ahead of me and I turn around and there's the silverback looking directly at me while I'm holding its infant and you know one of his females is down and it was it was the most I think intense moment because it it could have gone in several different directions and we just sort of caught each other's eye and it was it was very powerful so I just slowly put the baby down on the mother and backed off backed off and and it was amazing that he didn't attack actually and then the people came around and everything was fine but it's moments like that that, that really uh, it's, it's not necessarily uh, a moment that you want to have but uh, mm -hmm. they get exciting Wow yeah that's a good example that reminds me of um, a video that circled around online over the last couple of years that I'm sure you're aware of and I think is for a lot of people in the world their exposure to mountain gorillas um, was just a tourist who happened to have a camera out and um, had a very close interaction with a group of mountain gorillas who just kind of came up and investigated him and were kind of messing around with his hair and his glasses um, so that makes me um, kind of lead into the question, do you think that the tourism um, for the mountain gorillas is a good thing? And for us as veterinarians who may never get to actually do that for our jobs, is that a reasonable thing to think, well, I want to go to Rwanda or Uganda and do a mountain gorilla trek? Or do you think that that's more harmful than good? Well, it's a double-edged sword and you've, you've certainly nailed it on the head. But if you consider that the Rwandans gain $252 million a year out of the gorilla tourism. And that's just not from the permits. That's about $20 million alone, though. Uh, the rest of it's in hotels and tours and food and all that kind of stuff. But that is a major, major income for this country. Hmm. And it pretty much guarantees the protection of the park because they're paying for themselves. That said, again, as we said earlier, that 
the human, human disease is being transmitted to the gorillas is probably the biggest threat. And so there are viewing rules where you stay seven meters and you have to be over 15 years of age and you don't eat and different, different rules. But unfortunately, as you saw in that video, the gorillas don't read the rules and sometimes, you know, they are overcome with curiosity and will approach. And in, in that situation, they are outside the park at a lodge and so there wasn't any guides there to sort of, you know, ease that person out of the situation. So even though it was the most thrilling, probably, thing that he'd ever done in his life and was pretty exciting for other people, it's not the kind of experience that we like people to think of when they're coming here, just, just from that closeness and, and the potential damage that could be done from an experience like that. But I'd have to say that I have never heard of anybody, even with the price of, of the viewing the gorillas, to be disappointed when they left. Wow. And that's, that's a pretty amazing thing. Yeah. Yeah. Usually, some of them end up in tears and they're, you know, just sort of changes their whole perspective on, on life and wildlife. Yeah, I don't think that's true for almost any other vacation experience, which seemed to induce letdowns for a lot of people. So that's pretty cool. Um, are there any examples that have actually been documented or published of the gorillas catching human diseases from the tourists? Yes, uh, there's been one about two years ago where there, uh, the highest cause of clinical signs and death in the gorillas is actually trauma. And that trauma uh, often is, is gorilla gorilla induced. And so there's not, I mean, other than removing snares, and the snares aren't set for the gorillas, they're set for other bush meat, but the gorillas get caught in them. So other than that sort of uh, tack, there's not a lot we can do about the physical trauma that the gorillas induce on each other. Mm -hmm. However, the, the second highest uh, clinical signs, set of clinical signs and cause of mortality is respiratory diseases. And they have quite serious outbreaks. And some of them uh, just come and go and pass like, you know, an outbreak in a, a child's school, but some of them actually cause mortality. So this is where we put a lot of our effort. And two animals died in... Uh, I think it was 2009, and we uh, cultured their lungs and their, their nasal passages and things, and we sent it to a very uh, sophisticated lab in the United States where they did some uh, deep sequencing, searching for the organism, mm -hmm. and they found metanumavirus, and they sequenced it, and it was a South African human strain, and metanumavirus... Uh, mutates at a certain rate and this virus had not mutated so it had entered into the gorilla population relatively uh, recently okay. and we couldn't we didn't know I mean there's there's basically three three sort of groups of exposure one is the community where the gorillas come out into the community or the community people go in to get water or you know collect bamboo it's illegal but it still happens or it could be from the trackers and guides themselves or it came from an ecotourist and we've not been able to uh, nail that down, but we are, that has taught us that, that this is an area that we have to to look at more carefully, and we now have two PhD students actually working on this, this very angle, not so much from that definite outbreak, but just the pathogens that the tourists and stuff are carrying and the normal flora of the gorillas. Okay. Very nice. Um, well, let's go back into your career in education. Um, how did you first decide to become a vet? Well, my parents told me that I was talking about it when I was five years old, but I think that that, that might have been a little early. It was sort of like, you know, I want to be a fireman or something. Um, I guess it was high school and uh, par parental pressure wanted me to go into some sort of professional course. And I really liked the outdoors, actually. And so I thought I would become a large animal practitioner. And that's basically why I went through, decided to go to vet school. Okay. And I did do it for two years. Ah, okay. So you went all the way through college and vet school thinking traditional large animal medicine? No, actually, it's an odd story. I was very fortunate because... There is a utilities commission in Peterborough, which basically looks after your electricity and your drinking water and that kind of stuff. Well, in, in sometime in the, the 50s or maybe even 40s, one of the managers had gone down to Florida for a conference and he come back with two alligators. And from that, the utilities 
just uh, sort of in a weird way developed a whole zoo around it. So I got a job at utilities cutting grass, but then they found out that I was going to be a veterinarian, so they got me associated with the zoo. And so I was a zookeeper for five summers, putting myself through school. And, and that did two things. It, it, uh, I mean, I was riding with large animal practitioners at the same time I was being a zookeeper. And I, and I really enjoyed farms and the dairy practice and everything else. But it was sort of a matter of, you know, economics. And what, what could I do to help the farmer get more pounds of milk or to keep the animal alive so he could get it to market or, or whatever. And, in, and that's okay. There's nothing wrong with that. And I still totally believe in large animal medicine and enjoy it. But at the zoo, it seemed that here were these wonderful animals that nobody knew a lot about and they seem to have a larger role in life I mean for education and whatnot and I think just just the thrill of working you know with these different species like primates and, and deer and camels and it just just thrilled me you know to be able to be part of that and I never wanted any as pets but you know, just to be able to, to work with them and, and be around them was, was pretty exciting for me. Okay. And so that was all the way through undergrad and vet school that you were doing that? Well, I was in, I'm Canadian, so we were, back then we were allowed to take two years, and if we were doing well enough, we could slip right into yeah. veterinary medicine. So I did that, again, I did that for the five summers, okay. um, and, and so it was the whole time I was at University of Guelph. Okay. And then you graduated from vet school and decided, okay, now I need to make some money making a living, or what? No, not really. Uh, we, <laughs> what happened was I was graduating from school and looking for jobs, and uh, at that time there was only two openings, and that was the, the National Zoo in San Diego. And the National Zoo obviously was sponsored by the government, so they weren't taking Canadians. And there had been a Canadian at San Diego in the last, I don't know, three or four years, so they weren't, again, looking for Canadians. So I was immensely heartbroken and in tears, uh -huh. but I was able, I was able to get a, a large animal job in the, my hometown so I could still look after the animals that I'd been keeper for and still keep my fingers in, in the pot. Okay. And then... Uh, I answered every exotic job that came up, and, and finally there was this one for a veterinarian in California, and it was to look after a safari park. And so I answered the ad, and uh, it turned out they were shipping a bunch of exotic animals over to Japan to set up the safari park. Wow. And there was sort of a guarantee on the animals, so they wanted a veterinarian there to sort of make sure that everybody, everything was was up to par and that if the if there was a problem with the animal's health that was due to something lacking uh, from the Japanese then then they had sort of negotiations as it turned out it was a wonderful experience and 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 all the animals were were great and so I, when I was over in Japan I got a phone call saying that the Toronto Zoo was opening a residency and would I'd like to come back and do that and that was just like oh. Wow. I, I couldn't hardly wait to get on the boat. I love Japan, but I couldn't wait to get back to start uh, that. So that, then must, after, that must have meant that someone at the Toronto Zoo knew that you were interested and that you might be a good person to be their first resident. Well, I, it's funny because I was their local boy. You know, they'd heard of me from being at the Peterborough Zoo, and I did my three week rotation from vet school through there. Okay. So they, yes, they knew I was very anxious. And, and it was obviously a, a competition. And I'd been in several competitions and lost out to other people. And usually it was the same sort of relationship. You know, you'd, you'd be part of the, the last one's pick, but they, they would favor some guy that, you know, had been there since he was a, you know, a little kid or something. And so it was my lucky break that, you know, I was known at the Toronto Zoo. Okay, cool. So you took the residency, went through there, and yep, and, and then started looking for jobs again, and lo and behold, I ended up back in Peterborough. Uh, just, but that was just part time for about four months uh, until uh, a job opened up in Baltimore. And I was, again, I've been extremely, extremely fortunate because I went to Baltimore, and because there was a strong comparative medicine program at Johns Hopkins, they dealt a lot with the zoo. And so they gave me a small faculty position there 
and of course we collaborated on postmortems and research and whatnot. And at that time, Hopkins had a big interest in the zoo from what I was saying before, and also just in the management of the zoo, and they're all on the zoo board. So they had decided that they would build this wonderful large zoo hospital. And it, it literally at the time was the best zoo hospital in the world. And, you know, every job you go to, the director always says, well, they're going to build a new hospital. But this one, they'd actually broken ground, so I knew that they were going to do it. And, and uh, you know, I went there for one year. I was thinking of getting a job in Vancouver at a zoo that they were just building. And they sort of said, well, come back in a year and see what's happening. And uh, it's been so wonderful in Baltimore, I, I never really left. Wow. And so are you still actually employed through the Baltimore Zoo? Well, my office is, is still at the zoo. I'm paid by, employed by the uh, Wildlife Health Center at UC Davis. Okay. And I spend most, a lot of my time in Africa, as I am right now. Um, so basically what happened was I was progressing along, as most people do in their careers. And it was, it's, it's always a thrill to do clinical medicine and watch an animal improve. But after a while, you start seeing patterns, and and uh, or you and you see particularly small animals that are born at the zoo and die at the zoo, and you you kind of get there's got to be a bigger answer here, and you start looking at problems with species, um, different disease patterns within species, and and the way I looked at it was that the zoo veterinary team, they you know they should have a preventative program. They should have a good clinical program, but they should be doing research. And that research, to me, was, you know, getting better diagnostic tests and treatments for some of these diseases. And then that emerged, actually, to, um, well, let's look at the problems that species are having in the wild that we have animals for in captivity. Because, you know, there's, again, I'm sitting here with wild gorillas, and, and I can give an example. There was a, a group that got mange. Um, scabies and it was so devastating to the babies they were basically bald and scabby and, and losing serum and they, they would die I mean they would just lose interest in you know nursing and stuff so obviously the, the answer is to dart the adults twice 10 days apart with ivermectin and there's like 19 uh, gorillas in this group wow. And, and in actual fact, we got we got the first round over with, you know, there was people from the Ghana Wildlife Service and, and, and from the Gorilla Project. We got through the first round and everything was good, but then the gorillas were really on to us. And so basically, you treat them the first time, it kills all the adults, they start looking better, and then the eggs that are in the, in the tunnels and the skin start hatching out and, and it comes back. So we were lucky enough to... Um, find a, a ivermectin gold it's called and they were using it in Mexico and it's a depot product and it actually gives a long acting uh, blood level and it was long enough that it would outspan the scabies lifespan wow. but nobody had used it in gorillas hmm. and you have to be pretty pretty careful when you're using new drugs on a new species because there can be uh, idiosyncratic uh, reactions such as ivermectin in reptiles and in collies and things or you can actually change the flora or change the whole uh, ecology by by introducing these drugs and we we know that from the dung beetle in in the cattle industry you know the dung beetle started dying when everybody was using ivermectin because they were eating the, the ivermectin out of the feces and we are worried about the gorillas having microfilaria and we possibly killing the microfilaria and causing problems in the lungs and stuff like that. So we did the best we could and, and basically we used it in the zoo to make sure that it was harmless. And, you know, we, we really, I mean, ivermectin had been used in zoos for a while. So it was a long shot that it wasn't, wasn't going to be okay, but it still gives you that level of confidence. Mm -hmm. So that that's the kind of deal that we, we like to, to, I like to do at the zoo. And the other, other example was getting new diagnostic tests for even malaria and penguins. 
And penguins, the South African penguin lives on, on islands where there's very little fresh water and it's really windy. And so they didn't really evolve with the malarial parasites, so it's quite devastating when they get it. And we were able, through Hopkins and the National Institutes of Health, uh, start developing ELISA tests and PCR tests for that. So, so it, was, it was just a, a really nice career to have in this, this wonderful facility and with all these research institutions around that were, you know, highly academic and really interested in, in uh, problems and disease, disease uh, entities rather than just human research. Yeah, so that's quite really neat. Um, well, it's very appealing to me. <laughs> So then from that area, so it was a time when economic crisis sort of was coming down. And obviously one of the first things that has to, to be decreased if there's financial problems is, is research and, and some of that behind the scenes work because you have to keep you know, the public happy and education rolling. So at that time, uh, a friend of mine who had been manager for the Mountain Gorilla Veterinary Project died of a heart attack in Rwanda, unfortunately. Hmm. And I learned of that, and I had been doing some, some work with some other wild primate uh, species. And so I applied for this job, but this job at that point was basically in Rwanda, and Rwanda had just gone through the genocide and pretty tough wars. Mm -hmm. And so they said, well, your job would only be 15%. You, you would travel to Africa a couple times a year and they have a couple veterinarians there and you'd sort of keep things going. But at that time, the, the, there was so much unrest in the area that we weren't even allowed to come to where our clinic was. Mm -hmm. So basically for the first couple of years, it just consisted of me uh, trying to keep the morale up with the team that was here and discussing things with the, with the governments. Okay. But in about 2000, things broke loose and we were able to get back up the mountains. And so from that, my time expanded from 15% to, to 100%. But the, the Baltimore Zoo, again, was, was very amenable. And it was sort of, it's in the mission of a zoo to do conservation. And if you, you get even more kudos if you're doing conservation in the wild. So because that was centered, it was Morris Animal Foundation that was running it, but the, the zoo was, you know, helping with a lot of, uh, like the uh, biological resource center, and I had some secretarial help, and I had some finance, not um, accounting help. And so it was tightly linked with the Maryland Zoo for three or four years. And so that, that sort of really, uh, made it a tight, tight relationship. But it still wasn't sort of maybe the right home because the zoo was interested in wildlife and we were interested in One Health. Okay. But what the zoo did was allow us to have time and there was people on the board that were lawyers. So we got our 501c3, which was a big, big deal. And from that, we started uh, marketing ourselves to, to bigger, stronger conservation entities. And I was extremely lucky uh, that the Wildlife Health Center at UC Davis was interested and it, it's been basically a perfect match since. That's awesome. Yeah. Okay. Um, well, just kind of thinking about that idea of the zoos getting involved in conservation and wildlife out in the wild, it, I think that that's something that a lot of vet students and vets who are interested in zoo medicine kind of hope to be able to do is yes they love working with the zoo species at the zoo but they really want to make a difference in the world and are passionate about conservation and stuff like that and so do you think that that is realistic for someone going into zoo medicine to think that they'll be able to really get involved in conservation over their career too? Yes I do and, and I think it's happening more and more um, I think it's a really good thing, but I would would not want to have that as somebody's motivation. Um, depends on where their motivation level is. I mean, it's it's it's, and that's a tricky thing. If there's sort of a a thing like a professional vacation mm -hmm. where doctors or veterinarians come in and do a very small project and they come and they go, and then is the situation there really any better because they haven't 
made it sustainable. So I would, but I think that most zoos and veterinarians know that, and they're all getting involved now in sustainable programs, and and it's it's a pretty amazing thing to see. I think it, it's it's. It's basically almost part of a zoo job now to have some sort of project in the wild. Okay, that's good to know. Um, well, kind of let's go into thinking about for people who are interested in a career like yours or in um, becoming going through a residency and then working with these species either in zoos or in the wild. Um, I know that you interact with a lot of students and you probably hear from a lot of students. Um, maybe can you give your two-minute spiel that you tell them, okay, you want to have my job one day, here's what you need to do. Yeah, I think that, that when you start off, you should start before vet school and certainly get some hands-on experience. Uh, and that can be a humane society or vet office or whatever. And I think that you need to realize the realities of being a veterinarian and a veterinarian's life um, before you uh, apply and I think the schools now expect you to have done that and I think there are enough projects now in the wild that, that people are getting involved with them even before vet school or during vet school and I think that that's pretty amazing when I when I look at the qualifications and experience of some of the people in vet school or new graduates it's just amazing I mean they, they are probably at the level I was you know, 15 years after I got out, or 20 years. I mean, as far as their their interest in their in their um, desire for conservation. So, um, I think as you as you move along later in your career, when you start learning more about medicine, then I would probably your school is probably involved in some, or I would visit the local zoo and see what they're involved in, or just go on the website. You know, just sort of pick out species that you're interested in and get on get on the, the, the web. And there's usually, if you can finance your travels, there's usually a lot of opportunities, mm -hmm. I think. Yeah, anyway. and so that's the big if, if you can finance it. Do you know of any secret special ways that people have been successful about financing that kind of thing that you're aware yeah, there of? There's several foundations out there that finance students. Mm -hmm. so like the Morris they, Animal Foundation you mentioned. Yeah, exactly. Okay. And the Morris Animal Foundation ran this project for probably 18 years. Okay. That's where it started. Yeah, so they have a very strong wildlife component to their grants. Okay. Yeah, what I've always really tried to encourage people is to believe that there is someone that has the money that's willing to make this experience happen. So if you're willing to spend the time on... Google and writing your essays in Word and send them off to enough places, then I think that you can make it happen if you're willing to be persistent with that. And that's been my experience through vet school and before, um, and even applying for types of things that don't, don't necessarily just go for vet students or for wildlife work or something, but there's a lot of broader scholarship type of opportunities and research funding that if you can be creative in your descriptions, then you can convince someone that this is worthwhile doing. And right, and I totally agree with that. And the other thing that I would have to say is earlier in the interview, I said, you know, that I was heartbroken in tears that I couldn't do get into an internship right after school. I think that uh, having being in a ten-man large animal clinic, busy clinic was probably the best thing that ever happened to me because I think that you own your clinical skills and your prognosis and and it doesn't do you any harm. I mean, why it would be twice as difficult to do your first cesarean on, on a bison than it would, you know, on a, on a cow. And if you've done 15, 20 cesareans on cows in a year or so, then you, you, you have a better, much better idea of what you're coming up against. Mm -hmm. So I guess I would say to anybody, keep Keep in mind where you want to end up, but it's not necessarily a straight line. Mm -hmm. And, and to, to sort of exemplify that, when we uh, put out uh, job uh, quests, then the people say, well, what are you looking for? And I say, well, I need somebody that's got good, good clinical skills. They have some primate work, hopefully uh, great apes. They need to have uh, some insight into pathology. They need to have some understanding of... Uh, research and they have to have some they don't have to but we prefer that they have some 
foreign travel because you can get some very, very high, highly qualified people that can't function in a, in a foreign environment. So again, to the students that are coming along, if you can get that foreign experience, it's, it's pretty important to the people that will be hiring you later. And that will also help them to know if they actually enjoy working in those kind of settings. Exactly. <laughs> so they won't apply for that job later on if they don't like it. And so speaking about the money again, um, I know you're probably aware of that big New York Times article that came out earlier this week um, talking about the horrible state of veterinary student debt um, and salaries that are available as veterinarians. Um, do you have any insight into that for your particular field in zoo and wildlife medicine? Um, I know that the people I've talked to have generally said people go into this because they really love it, but unfortunately the salaries have never even been quite at the same level as your typical dog and cat vet. Do you think that that's the case and that's something that students need to be aware of and plan on, or do you think that that is not really true? No, I, I think it's it's absolutely true. And again, I came through the Canadian system, and when I got out, uh, even after having student loans, I owed four thousand dollars. Now, my my wage back then was thirteen thousand dollars a year. But even relatively speaking, I mean, I had that paid off in a couple of years, and I I I would hesitate and look twice to go to vet school. At, at the cost that it is and what what situation you're going to be in when you get out I mean that it's it's a difficult difficult decision and you know if I mean if I knew that I was going to have the career that I've had then I you know I might chance that or whatever but you know when you're when you're that young you really don't know when you're where you're going to end up and whether you're going to get to do your dream job and whatnot so it is extremely difficult, and, and I think, again, that's one thing that people have to look at. I mean, it's, it's really nice to do wildlife work, but what's that do to your personal lifestyle? You know, I mean, you're not, I don't think that you can be in the bush and raise a family properly, and, you know, and, and if you have $200,000 worth of debt, I mean, that's, it's going to be years before you're free of that, mm -hmm. and, and it's a terrible situation. I really, I don't know that there's any way around it, but it does seem that, that the really energetic and enthusiastic people do manage it and get some deferrals and whatnot mm -hmm. uh, until they can get into the range of money where they can pay it off. Yeah. But you're, you're absolutely right. I mean, you're, I don't know of any wildlife veterinarian that makes money as much money as they would in a private practice with the same qualifications. Okay. Yeah, that's good to know. And that's something that... Um, I think is just a realistic thing and because there are so many people that are interested in that kind of work then there's probably always going to be enough people who are willing to do it for a little bit less money the old right. law of supply and demand um, so. but I'd, I'd also have to say that the that, that that said I mean one has to look on at how I mean again with me graduating with a low um, loan, I could, I could, money didn't have to be as important to me. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I was just about to make the statement, well, it depends on, on one person's ideal of, of success and whether that's financial success or not. And money doesn't buy happiness, obviously, but the lack of money and having high loans can certainly put, can dampen that, mm -hmm. that enthusiasm. Yeah. So again, uh, just just from the profession as a whole, it's getting more difficult. Not not that the opportunities are decreasing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that was a lot of the reason that I decided to do the Army scholarship was thinking ahead, even though it may not be the ideal job that I want to do for my whole life. Hopefully it'll put me in a position after I finish my commitment here to maybe be more open to some positions in other types of jobs that I wouldn't have been able to if I had all those loans from Tufts otherwise if I didn't do the Army. Um, no, I, I fully agree with you. I think it's an interesting path. And uh, again, you know, it may seem like off the chosen path or what you really want to do, but in the end, it may, it may enhance your capability and your freedom. So, and, and in the meantime, you're getting all kinds of clinical experience, which will come in handy regardless of what species you're working with. 
Yep, just came over here from taking a look at a really bad ear infection on one of our working dogs, and he looks like he's going to need a um, little surgery to open up the oral hematoma he has going on, so I might be going back to the clinic after this, too. <laughs> well, you know, some some of the the problems that we see in hedgehogs have to do with mites and ears and really bad ear infections and stuff. So, you know, it, it all, it all sort of relates. And, and I don't, I think just as long as you're busy clinically or surgically or whatever, whatever you're doing, you're doing it with enthusiasm and, and trying to learn. And I don't think any of it goes to waste. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's good to know. Thank you. <laughs> um, so that's a little bit about for me. Um, but what about for a small animal vet who has been out of school for five or ten years and just now has come across this crazy army vets website who's re-inspiring them about their early dreams to be a zoo vet um, and I've heard from already 10 or 15 people like that and so I've been kind of telling them well at this point um, in the way the profession is I think there's two routes to go about working with wildlife species, there's going back for the zoo and zoo medicine residency, or there's going more the research route, looking at a PhD that you um, really put yourself in a position to be working more hands-on with the wildlife species and trying to create that kind of position for yourself. Um, do you think that that is realistic for someone? Do you know any zoo vets who actually have been out in practice for five or 10 years and then gone back to a residency? Not usually five or ten years, but I think what you just said was was absolutely spot on, and that is that yes, they they may be excellent small animal clinicians and have great clinical skills, but if they if they don't know the nuances of the other species, then they're a little bit behind. And and I also think that if it's somebody that's like, well, I'm done with these dogs and cats, so I'm looking for something else. Maybe I'll go into wildlife. That that kind of person I don't think is going to make it but if it's somebody that did dogs and cats or, or the army like you to get to their dream then they probably also volunteered at, at zoos or you know had done some rehab or something so that they're fairly aware but you're absolutely right that I think that, that they should, should uh, entertain the thought of going back because they're going to be competing against kids coming out that have a pretty unique education relative to the practitioner that's been out for a long time. Mm -hmm. And I think that the thing you said about research is spot on. I mean, if somebody had an interest in, in wildlife and they, and they took a PhD, then they're going to establish themselves, right? I mean, it's, it's, it's good. That's, that's an excellent route to go. Okay. And it would also show their seriousness. Yeah. And you mentioned you have a couple of PhD students there. Are they vets, or are they coming from different backgrounds, or what? No, they're, they're, they came up through the, the veterinary programs. Okay. And some of, them, some of them have two or three years of clinical practice. I don't, again, I don't think that it's, that's bad. But I, I do see some practitioners, or I, I, you know, they come up to me, and they've been in practice maybe even longer, like 15, 20 years, and they're like, yeah, I'm just kind of fed up. I don't need the money, so I, I'm thinking of doing wildlife. And if they're really serious and... and, and and sort of, I don't want to say pay the dues because that sounds like old boys club, but, but, but go out and learn, learn. I mean, they got the clinical thing down. Now they got to get the wildlife thing down and, and the behaviors and, and how to incorporate all that great experience they have in the field. I mean, they might be a great orthopedic surgeon, but that may not help them with gorillas because, you know, we, we don't pin or plate in the field. They usually just they heal on their own, and they often have function. So, actually, the other thing that, that happens is, like, when I, when I was at the zoo, or even now, I often feel like I'm just a phone jockey, you know? I mean, something's got a broken leg, so I, I phone the orthopedic guy, and he comes in. So there is, I mean, whatever the specialty is, the person could get in contact with either a wildlife project or, or their local zoo or rehab and, and get a lot of experience that way. Yeah. Yeah, I remember I did an externship at the National Zoo, and it was every few days it seemed like we had some specialist, veterinary specialist, coming in to help with the procedure, whether it's the cardiologist or the orthopedic surgeon, like you said. Um, 
and they've kind of made a niche for themselves even though they didn't have any formal training in zoo or wildlife species they've now become the go-to person for gorilla cardiology in dc so right um, that's and, and i think that that sometimes is is enough you know i mean i don't know that a guy that's been making a lot of money and is established in his house and has his family is going to be able to put the the effort that often needs to be taken if you're going to go to a foreign place. So if they get involved and use their expertise, either with, again, you know, whether it's a conservation program doing river otters or whatever, that may be enough just to keep them enthused about their own, their own careers okay. and, and keep them, you know, happy and at home and, you know, in their structured life the way they have been. So I, I think that that's a wonderful route too okay. and encourage everybody because because uh, most programs are looking for specialists of one sort or another. Okay. Yeah, well, that's definitely something I'll keep in mind as I talk to people about it. Um, well, we're getting short on time here, but maybe could you just kind of give a couple of things that you've really enjoyed about what you've been able to do as a veterinarian in the specific field that you've done? Like looking on your career, what are some of the highlights that you've enjoyed? I think just uh, being around and being able to work with some of the species that I've worked with is just such a thrill. I mean, it's just a, a real blessing. Um, I think that, that being having the opportunity that I had in Baltimore to be able to develop some diagnostic tests and then go into the field and, and see them functioning and helping is probably the biggest thrill. And and the other thing that I've always wanted to do, still want to do, is travel. And it's, it's, again, most of my travel is associated with my job. And so um, it, it's, an, it's nice because you don't make enough to necessarily do all this traveling as a, a vacation. But if you can combine the both of them, it's, it's awesome. Okay. Well, great. Um, that's all really helpful and um, inspiring for me. And I know that it'll be good for our listeners too. Um, are there any final words you'd like to share? <laughs> I'd just say that uh, if I look back when I was a teenager, I had no idea where I would end up and I think that you have to apply yourself and you have to be ready to open the doors of opportunity when they're there and, and I think that that's a major deal and, and as you progress in your career more and more doors open and you have to be willing to walk through them and and, and don't give up and I think that they're like people say well I, I really wanted to do that but I don't think there's enough opportunities well I don't believe that I think there's more and more opportunities coming and there's so much room in conservation and and one health and all of those things you can almost make a niche for yourself and that, I guess that's the deal. Just keep on going and find your little niche because there's enough out there. All right. Well, thank you so much, Mike. Um, it's been great talking with you. And we'll have this interview and some more information, um, things we've talked about, linked on my website, which is www.elliotgarber.com. And um, we'll finish it out there. So thank you so much, Mike. Great. We'll talk to you later. Well, thank you. And I, and I think it's a really interesting website, interesting uh, uh, topic, you know, because a lot of people it's, don't think of that when, when they're moving along. So I, I, I commend you on your work. Okay. Well, thank you so much. We'll be in touch. Bye-bye. <laughs>